Let's do one more. Let's sing to his great name. I like this. Foster say. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for who we are in Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. And Lord, as we gathered here today to worship you, we pray that we'll worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray for this time as we sing. Lord, may it be more than just words on a screen. And Lord, that'll be words that come from our heart in praise and honor and adoration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray if there's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that before they leave this place today, that they'll place their faith and trust in you and enter into that relationship with you where there's forgiveness and love. And Lord, where we are made new in Christ, Lord, we'll give you the thanks and the praise for all that you do. And Lord, we pray for Brother Jerry this morning as he brings the message. Lord, that you just anoint him and speak through him. May we be encouraged and challenged in our walk with you. And Father, we just pray that you be glorified in all that is said and done in this place. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you're not a member of First Baptist, we welcome you today. And you can go to, on your smart device, you can go to guest.fbcfw.org and register your being with us uh, here today. And if for some reason you don't have a smart device, uh, you can just do it the old-fashioned way. Reach in the chair in front of you and take out a registration card, fill it up, and drop it in the offering plate when it's passed in just a few moments. And at this time, we'll ask our ushers to go ahead and take their places. And as they're coming, let me remind you just of a couple of things. First of all, uh, if you have a student uh, in your home and uh, or you're a grandparent of a student that may not live with you, uh, we have a D-Now weekend coming up. Uh, it's uh, February the 20th, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. And uh, you need to register your grandkids, your students, to be part of D-Now. Uh, amen? Church, are you awake this morning? Amen? Let's, let's don't make it hard on Brother Jerry this morning, all right? Uh, you need to have your kids register, your students registered for D-Now weekend. Uh, and so be sure to sign them up, and uh, the you can sign them up and save uh, $10 per student if they're signed up by February the 12th. Uh, now I know we're a Baptist church, and Baptists wait to the last minute, don't wait to the last minute, all right? Get your student registered for D-Now Weekend. It'll be an exciting time. Uh, they'll have fun. They'll grow in their relationship with the Lord, and they'll be challenged in their walk. So be sure to get them signed up for D-Now. I'm going to ask Brother Walt Stokes, if you would, would you write a prayer for the offering this morning?
stand. As a church, we, we're proclaiming that to you, but I think as a church we can proclaim that together, right? So let's sing right. that chorus just one time. So I come to tell you he's alive, to tell you that he dies, every tear that falls. So I come to tell you that he saves, to shout and to proclaim that he's coming back for you. Yes, I come. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. And He is one day coming back for you. You may be seated. We thank the Lord for uh, our worship ministry and team. And uh, the, my brother and his family were supposed to be here today. And he called last week and said, I have laryngitis. Don't know. I'll be over it in a week. And uh, so they are not here. But our special guest speaker is here today, Jerry Thorpe. And would you make Brother Jerry welcome this morning as he comes to preach for us. Thank you. Perhaps my favorite commercial during the Christmas season was put on the TV by Amazon Prime. And if you remember it, there's a little red-headed girl with a toy piano. And she is singing, everybody needs somebody to love. I got that about Christmas, so develop this message. I believe that. I believe everybody needs somebody to love, and that's my theme today. I'm going to give you some biblical and practical advice on three areas of love that everybody needs, three great loves, and I hope you'll listen. I pastored a long time. Sometimes I wonder, are you listening? <laughs> I read of a pastor who loved to deer hunt, so he asked a couple of his men, to go deer hunting with him and one took his teenage son and they're out in the fields and a deer came up and all three of the guys shot at the same time and the deer fell. So the father kind of said jokingly to his son, son, go check the deer and see which one of our bullets killed him. <laughs> so the kid ran up there and checked it and he hollered back and said, the preacher's bullet killed it. And the preacher said, how do you know it was my bullet that killed it? And the boy said, because the bullet went in one ear and out the other, so we <laughs> knew it was yours. In 1961, the song said, love makes the world go round. And I think that's pretty accurate. Humorous Franklin P. Jones said, love doesn't make the world go round. Love is what makes the ride worthwhile. Well, I think love is vital to all of our lives. I, I want to ask you a question. Do you think it is possible to live a successful life if you don't love anybody and no one loves you? No. I don't think so. Unfortunately, in the English language, we only have one word to cover all of the different aspects we use it to call love. It's probably one of the most misused and abused words in the English language. We use the same word to say, I love a Whataburger, and I love my wife. <laughs> okay, there's a difference there. We need two words for that, but we only have one. I love your hair, I love my children. I love that car, I love my mother, really? I love that dog, I love Jesus. We need two words. Some time ago, the song said, Hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You love her and you don't know her name yet? And maybe somebody would say, I met a girl in a bar last night and we went to a motel and made love. Whoa, 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 wait. You made what? You made love? And leave it to country music to take it a step further. One of their songs said, I fell in the commode of love and you keep pulling the handle. That's a, <laughs> It's one of the great songs in country music. I think it is interesting that in the Greek language in which most of the New Testament was written, 
there are three different words for degrees of love. There's the word eros, that's a sensual love. It's a self-serving love. It's a love that takes instead of gives. Pornography is eros. I met a girl in a bar last night, that's eros. That word's never used in the Bible. And then there's the word phileo or phileo, from which we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's a, good, it's a good word and it is used in the Bible. But the strongest one, and the one we will use for this message this morning, is the word agape. It is a love that gives instead of takes. It desires only the best for the one that you love. It is probably best illustrated by this verse. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this morning I'm going to talk to you in a practical way and in a biblical way about three areas of your life that I think God expects agape love of you. First of all, love your friends with an agape love. Abraham Lincoln, 16th president of these United States and one of the greatest men in American history once said, the better part of one's life consists of friendship. Socrates once asked a simple old man for what he was most thankful and the old fellow replied that being such as I am, I've had the friends that I have had. I suspect all of you in this room, teenagers and all of you, have a lot of acquaintance but most of us have very few friends in the biblical sense of the word because friendship's on a very high level in the Bible. One of the strongest verses, Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. I think there are three things that define biblical friendship. First of all, a true friend is someone who walks in when the world walks out. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 on your screen. A friend loves at all times. Now, as I said, we've got a lot of acquaintances. But do you have a friend that would walk in when the world walks out? Who loves you even when you make mistakes? Who loves you in spite of you? Maybe I could say it that word. That person is a rare treasure to you. If you have someone in your life who've walked together with you for a period of time till you understand they love you biblically, they would walk in when the world walked out. Uh, that's a very special person. And second, a true friend is someone who is morally elevating. A true biblical friend would be someone who is lifting you up morally when you're around them. You're always challenged to be a better person when you're with them. Let me even define it more. They're always pulling you up to a higher level because their example inspires your language. Your language is better because of being with them and you've learned something. Some of that's rubbed off on you. Your morals are better because of them. Your habits are better. Your treatment of others is better. Your marriage is better. And I say that because when I was growing up, and I wonder if you're the same, I had some friends back in my teen years and for a little after that who were not morally elevating. Did you ever have one of them in your life who was always kind of pulling you down to their level, who was always challenging you to do something you weren't really comfortable with, but you were with them? A friend, a true friend, should be morally elevating. Your friends ought to be people who make you better. Here's a verse, Proverbs 12, 26. Interesting verse. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. In all the 36 years I pastored in Odessa, now and then we'd have a teenager doing great, and, and, you know, and then all of a sudden it seemed like they twisted off, and, and you talk to the parents, what happened? And it, almost invariably they'd say, Jerry, they got in with the wrong crowd. They got in with somebody who wasn't morally elevating. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. A true friend is somebody who walks in when the world walks out. A true friend is someone who is morally elevating. And third, I, I just want to use this as a personal example. 
A true friend is someone who is mentally stimulating. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Let me give you a personal example. I graduated from high school in 1954. I wasn't a good student. I didn't have anything together in my life. I was involved in nothing in the three years of our high school structure in Odessa. I wasn't in band speed. I was involved in nothing. My grades, whew. I would say it this way. It was people like me who made the top half of the class possible. <laughs> you understand what I mean by that? And when I graduated from high school, they put our annual and the stuff we had done, which in my case was a picture in my name, and we all wrote our ambitions, and my ambition was to have an ambition. <laughs> but something happened to me when I was a freshman in college in a service just like this. The Lord Jesus that you've been singing about this morning so moved my heart. I was so much under conviction about where I was going and that I had rejected his love and all he had done for me on Calvary's cross that I stepped out at the close of the service and, and bowed my head and, and confessed to a holy God that I was an unholy person and asked him to come into my life and change my life. And that night, the first Sunday night of January 1955, Jesus Christ saved me and totally changed my life. Three years later, I felt like God called me to be a preacher, which totally astounded me. Because I knew if I was God, I wouldn't have called somebody like me to be a preacher. But the call of God was sure, and I surrendered my life. And in September of that year, I left Odessa, Texas, in a 1947 Maroon Ford, and went to Springfield, Missouri, to go to Baptist Bible College. And there, by the grace of Almighty God, I met and became lifelong friends and college roommates with Truman Dollar, a young man from Pampa, Texas. Now, I did not over-exaggerate how worthless my high school years were. But Truman was the exact opposite. I don't know what brought us together, grace of God, I'm grateful, but we just were attracted and we became friends, lifelong friends. Truman pastored some of the largest churches in this, in this nation. I preached for Truman all of the places he was. We spent time together, we talked all the time. He set a standard of excellence in my life that I hadn't seen before from our first days together. He taught me so much how to present myself. He challenged my study habits. He challenged my reading. He challenged the way I dressed. He challenged my preaching. He challenged my dealings with people. I know God brought him into my life at a very special time. I needed him. I needed someone like him to set some guidelines in my life and challenge me to be better, to be mentally stimulating for me and to let me know there's a better way, there's a better life, you need to get on this level. And he continued to do that until he died. I owe him so much, aside from my father, I don't know anybody on this earth that I owe more than Truman Dollar for what he added to my life. And thankfully, I wrote him a long letter expressing in detail how much I loved him and how much I appreciated what he had done for me and how he had changed my life. You know something, guys? As I get older, I realize even more that aside from my family, the great joy of my life are my friends. I am not self-sustaining. I am not independent. I'm not going to make it by myself. I need my friends. And if you have friends like that who, who love you, not like the prodigal son who friends loved him until the money ran out and he found out he didn't have any true friends at all. No, I'm talking about a true friend who loves you, who's morally elevating, who's mentally stimulating. You need to really cherish that relationship. Amen. You need to let them know how much you appreciate, male or female, teen or over. You need to let them know how much they mean to you and how much your life is better because of their friendship. The Bible said, Proverbs 27, 10, do not forsake your old friend. So take time to tell them. And that's my first point. You're to love your friends with an agape love. Second thought, love your family. And I'm going to major on your marriage. Love your family with an agape love. 
Now, I think a single person wrote this. I don't know. I don't know who the author was, but I think it was a single person. He said, it just dawned on me why Mayberry was so peaceful and quiet. Nobody was married. <laughs> Here are the single people that come to mind. Andy Griffith, Aunt B, Barney, Floyd, Howard, Goober, Gomer, Sam, Ernest T. Bass, Helen, Thelma Lou, and Clara. In fact, the only one married was Otis, and he stayed drunk all the time. Yeah, wow. That's the reason I say it. Single person wrote that. <laughs> a good marriage is so beautiful. I, I'm just going to talk to you about your marriage, you that are married and you that plan to be married. A good marriage is so beautiful. I believe when your marriage is right, everything in your world will be pretty right. And when your marriage gets messed up, everything in your world can get messed up. And I'm living this because sitting right down here on the front row is this little lady named Freddie. We've been married 61 and a half years. Wow. I'm now 83. We got married when we were just kids, really. I got her out of high school. That's about as far as I got her. And we got married. And I'm Kelly, I, I, I tell her this, not just when I'm standing up here. I could not tell you how much I love her. I cannot tell you how much she means to me, how she's changed my life, how something happened to her. My life would just, wow, I can't even, I don't even want to think about it. So what I'm telling you about marriage is something that I've experienced and lived. The Bible said when God was giving me my instructions as to how I'm to treat Freddie, he said in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives. Are you watching it, guys? Even as Christ loved the church and, what's the next word? Gave. gave. God loved the church so much he gave himself for her. And Jerry, I want you to love Freddie to the extent that you will give yourself for her. You see, guys, love is something you make happen. It's a choice. People don't fall in love. We fall into fascination. We fall into infatuation. But that's different from being in love. Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. Thankfully, in my case, for Freddie, it's an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. And we fell in love because of the way we treated each other, and we were treating each other with an agape love. It was not taking, it was giving when we were dating. You remember? <laughs> was it so long ago that you forgotten what your date life was like? You remember there was seemingly endless communication. When I was pastoring, I, I'm, I married hundreds and hundreds of kids, and they'd come to me, and if I ever said, why do you guys think you love each other? They always said, oh, Jerry, we talk and talk and talk, and we just talk and talk and talk, and we did. We talked and we talked and we talked, and we weren't communicating by conflict, and we weren't hollering at each other, and we weren't calling each other bad names. We communicated, and then we get married. And marriage people say that one of the first things that breaks down in a marriage is communication. We quit talking. And it's the man who quits talking. Women don't quit talking. It's the man <laughs> who quits talking. And then we start communicating sometimes by conflict. We communicated. We had kindness. We had creativity. We had so much laughter. We had so much excitement. And we noticed and complimented. You guys remember? I'm going to pick on you primarily in this point. We noticed and complimented everything. Do you remember when you were dating and when you walked in and saw her for the evening? You remember what you did? Whoa. Oh, wow. Ooh, you're so beautiful. It takes my breath away. I love your hair. I love it when you wear your hair that way. Ooh, I love that perfume. That perfume is beautiful. Oh, I love that dress. That dress is great. I love your mother. I love those shoes. <laughs> you remember? Remember when you noticed and appreciated everything? Do you still? You pull out the dresser drawer and there's clean underwear and stuff. Well, how do you think those get there? Do you think angels brought those down from heaven and put them there? Do you ever notice and appreciate when you eat a great meal? Do you just stand up and burp? Oh, I can't remember eating that. And, well, honey, <laughs> clean these dishes up and we'll watch TV. No, no. 
You remember when you got ready to leave? She put her hand in your arm and you walked out to the car and she took her hand and reached for the car door and you said, no, 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 honey, as long as you're with me, those beautiful hands of yours will never touch a car door. I will always open the door. And you got in and sat down and you turned to her and said, now what would you like to do tonight? And she said, oh, whatever. No, 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 honey, as long as you're with me, it'll never be what I want to do. It will always be what you want to do. Where would you like to eat tonight? Oh, whatever you, no, 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 no. No, 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 it'll never be what I want to eat. will always be what you want to eat. And our total approach is what will make you happy? What were we doing? We're loving her with an agape love. We are giving and not just taking. Love her with an agape love. And they will get married. And sometimes you get used to each other and you can end up in a marriage rut. And all of a sudden, the imagination, the thoughtfulness, the creativity, and eventually your love can cool, and then you can begin taking instead of giving. I asked a guy one time, tell me five things you could do to make your marriage better. He said, oh, Jerry, that's easy. Yeah, if my wife would do this, and if she'd do that, and if she'd quit doing this, and I said, whoa, 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 Jack, I didn't ask you five things your wife could do. Tell me five things you could do. How could you treat her better? What are the things you did when she fell in love with you? I didn't have this in the notes, but a lady came up to me and said, Jerry, I don't know what happened. When we were dating, he was so romantic. He was so thoughtful. He was so much fun to be with. We had such a great time. And then we got married, and it slowly it all went away. I thought I'd married Rudolph Valentino on a good day. I think I'm just married to a recliner that burps. And I had a guy, a preacher, I don't know what happened. I don't know, man. When I was dating that woman, she has turned on. I mean, she is hot-blooded. We had it going. I mean, it was wonderful. But now, man, she's a, just a cold fish. Preacher, that woman's changed. And I said, no, no, you're wrong. That woman hadn't changed at all. That's the same girl you married. I'll tell you who changed, you changed. And quit treating her the way you were treating her when you fell in love with each other. Well, I'm sorry, guys, to be rough on you, but I just challenge all of you to let an agape love, agape love gives instead of takes. Agape love doesn't sit around and say, what can you do for me? It's what can I do for you? Love is not 50-50. Love is 100-100. You're 100% for her. She's 100% for you. Amen. And I want to challenge you to let agape love. And I want to challenge you on one other thing before I leave this point. We live in a culture that is devaluing marriage. It's like, uh, it's a shop window where some mean person has changed the prices around. And that which is valuable is priced cheap. And that which is cheap has a high price tag. Well, I'm telling you, they've got it messed up. Marriage is a very high price tag. Amen. And you love her and love him with all of your heart and soul. Love your friends with an agape love. Love your family with an agape love. Let me give you one other thought. Love Jesus Christ with an agape love. The Lord said the greatest commandment, first and greatest commandments, that we love God with all our heart and soul. And we prove that by our worship. Worship is simply coming apart from your busy world. Stay with me. I didn't say worship is coming to church. A part of worship is coming to church, but worship is coming apart from your busy world, publicly and privately, sitting still before God. Maybe singing hymns of praise. Reading the scripture. Saying your prayers. Asking his forgiveness. Asking his help. And letting God know that he is meaningful to you. That you're not just fond of him, but that you love him. Worship is expressing love to God, and we all know how much we love God. It's evident by our lives, and God's aware of it also. I just wonder, how many of you walked in here this morning, and when you walked to the door, God said, or you walked to the door and you said, Hi, God. And God said, Hi, where you been? Whoa, 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 what do you mean where I've been? I was here last Sunday. Yeah, I know you were here last Sunday, but I really wanted to talk to you Monday. I thought maybe you would pray Monday and talk to me, but you didn't. 
And I thought maybe you'd take your Bible and open your Bible and let me talk to you, but you didn't. But I thought, well, they didn't do it Monday, but they will do it Tuesday. But Tuesday, you were busy. And Wednesday, you were busy. And I thought maybe you'd talk to me Thursday or Friday or Saturday. But you were busy. Uh, true worship is coming apart publicly and privately. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, God addresses himself to seven churches. The first is a church at Ephesus, and it's a great church. They did so much right. Read it on your screen with me. The, here's, the Lord just said what he appreciated about those churches. And he said, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know you, how can, you can't bear those that are evil. You've tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. You've borne, you've had patience. For my name's sake has labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. There's so much that's good about that church. Just like you could go down the road with your church, you do this and this and this and this, you do it good. When I was pastoring in Odessa, I, I did a sermon on the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And when I got to Ephesus and studied, I, I was feeling pretty good about working my way through this because I thought our church was doing so much of this right. I mean, the Lord said, you worked hard, and I was working hard, and our staff was working hard, and our church was growing. He said, you're patient, you've been through persecution, but you've stayed true. You stood against evil, you cannot bear those that say they're apostles and are not. You've tried them doctrinally, and you're and you stood against evil because you cannot bear those that are evil. And you look at a church like that or a person like that and they seem invincible. They, ought to, they just really had one big problem. It's the only thing the Lord said about them. He said, you've left your first love. Well, what is first love? Well, to me, first love is when I was first saved. That Sunday night I told you about early in the service when I stood in that church and I had been this is a religious word but I had been redeemed I'd been redeemed for the first time in my life I was forgiven for the first time in my life I had peace with God I didn't look at it but something totally changed on the inside of me and I walked out of that church and it's like the whole world was different. I'm not trying to be mystic. That's just what happened that night. I had such a sense of forgiveness of God. My life was changed. Now, you know something that night? I didn't love the Bible. I mean, I respected it, but I didn't know that much about the Bible. I love Jesus. So I'm just past a cross. It was a bloody cross. I knew whose blood had been shed there. I knew the price Jesus paid for my redemption. I love Jesus. I could have sung, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how you could love somebody like me, a sinner condemned and unclean. I, I didn't love the church. I just got saved. I didn't love the music of the church. I didn't love the people of the church. I love Jesus. Go back to when you were first saved. Who did you love when you first got saved? You loved Jesus. And do you remember how you loved him? I'm going to give you three thoughts in closing. First of all, you loved him emotionally. You loved him emotionally. My dad, uh, for you that are with me on Facebook, I wrote about this yesterday. Uh, my dad was saved when he was 26. He was aroused about New Mexico. He wasn't in church. He didn't even have a Bible. Pulled out beside his bed on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ. And he went back to work and on that oil rig and the guy heard he'd got saved and gave him a New Testament. And Freddie and I were traveling up through the Canadian Rockies. We took mom and dad and he's in his late 70s or early 80s then. And we're riding along, I was driving, girls were in the back and dad was sitting in the front. And he started telling me about when he got saved. And I looked over and his cheeks were wet with tears. And he said, son, when I got saved, your mother and I didn't go to church. Nobody was talking to us about the Lord. We didn't know anything. 
And I got out beside my bed and got saved and said, my life's so changed. And he said, I didn't even have a Bible. And somebody gave me a little New Testament. One of the guys on the rig gave me a New Testament. And he said, before I got saved, I used to gamble when the rig shut down. But I thought after I got saved, maybe I shouldn't do that. So he said, I would go over and sit on an oil barrel and open the Word of God, and I'd read the Word of God. And I looked over at my dad was just, as I said, just weeping. And he said, you know something, son? I couldn't read of the crucifixion of Christ without crying. I'd read about what Jesus did for me and how he died for me, and I'd sit on that old oil barrel, and I would cry, and I would cry, and I would cry. You know why? He loved Jesus emotionally. I've been saved over 60 years. I read about the crucifixion all the time, but do I read the crucifixion and cry and cry and cry because of what Jesus did for me? And second, I challenge you to love the Lord enthusiastically. Love him enthusiastically. Now, this is a crazy story. There was this young, you teenagers here, there's a young guy, he's a football player in a high school in Chicago, got saved, really got full of Jesus, and he's walking home from football practice, and he took his helmet for some reason, maybe he's going to polish it or something, took his books, and he cuts through a park where they had a speaker stand where anybody could get up and talk on anything they wanted to for 15 minutes. And as he's walking through a park, he just drifted over there, and there was a guy who was atheistic, and he was just damning Jesus Christ and mocking him and the Bible and and just really being really rough on it. And he was saying, there is no God, and the Bible is a book of lies, and Jesus Christ is a fraud. It's all a joke. You're crazy. Believe it. And he came kind of to the close of it, and he said, and I'll prove it to you. And he and just leaned back and said, hey, God, if you're up there, I dare you, strike me dead. God, if you're up there, I'm going to count to 10. If you're up there, strike me. So he started counting, 10, 9, 8. Come on, God, where are you? There's no God. You Christians are crazy. And he got down to three, and that's all that kid could take. They said he dropped his book, put on his football helmet, and took a run and hit that old boy right in the chest and knocked him flat. And then he stood over him, one leg on one side and one on the other, and said, God was real busy, so he sent me to do that for him. Okay? That's what you call loving the Lord enthusiastically. One other thought. I challenge you to love the Lord foundationally. Let me illustrate it this way. In a drafty old barn out in the middle of nowhere, it had been abandoned, a spider let down a strand from the ceiling and began to make a web. And he was very good, very good. The web got larger and larger, and it was beautiful, and he caught many delicacies in his web. And spiders began to come from other barns to see this web. They'd never seen a web that beautiful. They organized tours, spider tours, to come and look at that (laughs) web because it was so beautiful. He was spider of the year in Time Magazine (laughs) one year. He was really good. And one day he was in the moonlight crawling on his web and he came to the top and he saw that strand and he forgot what it was. And he reached up and clipped it and when he did the whole web fell. See, 1900 years ago, God let a strand down from heaven. That strand is Jesus Christ. And that's where my Christian life began and I can build a web. And if you're good at what you do in the church, Ricky, good with music, you guys that are on the staff, good with what you do, preacher, good with what you do, people who sing with what you do, you can get pretty proud of the web that you're creating, but don't ever forget the strand. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. And one last thought. I've already said that one last thought. One more last thought. (laughs) Did you notice that the Lord did not say you've lost your first love? He said you've left it. There's a difference between lost and left. Now Fred will kill me for saying this, but probably if I lost my key to the car and I would say to her, Freddie, I've lost my key, she would every time say, well, where did you leave it? 
Okay, let's back it up. I've lost it, which means I have no idea where it is. Now, sometimes we're out to eat, and I'll leave my phone, and we get in the car, and I say, ah, what happened? I left my phone. It's just whether I'm willing to go back and get it. The Lord didn't say, you've lost the way you loved me at the beginning. He said, you've left it. I just wonder if you're willing to go back and get it. Love your friends. Love your family. Some of you kind of drifted maybe in your marriage. Won't you pull it back in? Pull it back in. Start doing the things again that made it beautiful in the beginning. And start loving the Lord emotionally, enthusiastically, foundationally. I think it would be wrong to come to a close of a service like this without at least giving us a chance to pray. As a preacher prayed in the beginning, maybe someone here has never accepted Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why I got saved. What a great morning for you to accept the Lord. Maybe you'd like to just come. Maybe just stand here where I'm standing, but on the floor here, and just spend a moment. Maybe you and your wife, maybe you'd just like to say, honey, I want to stand before God and say I love you and I'm grateful for our marriage and it's beautiful and proud. Maybe you need to say, I'm, I'm going to do better. Hmm? Maybe you need to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm so busy in my world. Uh, this hasn't had much of a part in it and prayer hasn't had much of a part. Maybe you just need to come and just spend a few moments. It, I'm not giving reports on anything. I'm just saying sometimes we need to pray. We don't pray enough. One thing I admire about the Catholic Church, I got that little bench, you can kneel down there and pray. Everybody does. Probably good for us more. So I'm just asking you, would you like to come here? And just stand here and pray, or you can pray where you seat. But there's something about publicly coming and saying, I love you, I love the Lord, ah, that's, that's special. So let's stand together with heads bowed for just a moment. Heads bowed. Now, would some of you like to come? Would like some of you like to come and pray? It doesn't matter what anybody else does. You do what it's right for you to do. Would you like to come and say, Lord, I want to love you more. I'm sorry. I'm not loving you as I ought to love you. And just come and tell him that. Just do it right now, even before I pray, before we start. Just come. I want to love you more. If you're here and you've never been saved, but you'd like to be, would you just step out right now and come? Father, thank you for the privilege of speaking. And Lord, pray we won't be shy or embarrassed or neglectful for an opportunity where you've touched our hearts. And we need to come and just thank you, love you, pray with you. Oh God, help us to do it. Help us to do it this morning. As we sing, Lord, help us to do it.